I've always been interested in dual spaces, interior space, exterior space, and the way in which that term relates to the interior part of the body and the exterior part of the body, as well as to a lot of political issues as, as they relate. So when you start thinking about opposites like that, you get things like life, death, freedom, oppression, and all those issues have been part of the work over a period of time. But the initial impetus was on interior and exterior spaces. And in the early days, in the 60s, when I was in California, I was doing a series of pieces that were, a series of works that, was, that I call microscapes. And it was like a little circular environment where you had a landscape, but the landscape extended beyond the circle and disappeared behind the mat. So it was like the interior space and the exterior space working at the same time. And, and since then, over the years, I have never been able to, well, I've been able to, I just haven't had the inclination to stay within the boundaries of the paper space or the canvas space. Things extend beyond that. And so we get things like, in some paintings I have to frame them in such a way that they're they're floating and not hidden behind a mat. And some pieces that are on canvas or on board panels, uh, they extend beyond the surface and they just kind of hang over the edge. <laughs> I, th I think it may drive some people up the wall, but uh, it's kind of intriguing. The interior exterior spaces. One of the things that, that I found very intriguing was the, the impact that the work had on other people. And I was privileged to, to hear some of the comments from folk. In fact, when I retired from Georgia State University, around that time, or just before that, I guess, I had, had an exhibition at the Camille Love Gallery. And one of the faculty members from the university had seen the exhibition. So when, when I had my retrospective at Georgia State University when I retired, there was a little book that people could write in. Well, this faculty member wrote in the book and he, he wrote something to the effect that his, his father was living with them and his father was cantankerous and mean-spirited and so forth. And the family got tired of all of this, so they put him in a nursing home and he would go to visit his father at the nursing home. And every time he visited his father, his father would say, when are we going home, Sonny? So the professor started thinking about some of my paintings that he had seen at various exhibitions, particularly the one at Camille Love Gallery. And uh, he felt that seeing those paintings of tall, thin, emaciated men standing in, a, in an alone space was kind of meaningful and it affected him. And he thought about his father being alone in a nursing home and wanting to be back with his family. So on one visit to the nursing home, when he got ready to go, the father said, when are we going home, sonny? So he, he just packed his father up and took him home with him. And he says, his father was still cantankerous and still mean-spirited, but in the end, he was very glad that he had done that because he got to know his dad in a different way and experience some things that he would not have experienced otherwise. So, and all that was because of, he, he attributed it to my paintings. <laughs> so it's kind of amazing how uh, the work affects other people. I don't want to dictate how they feel. Uh, they should be able to feel and express what they, whatever's happening with them based on their experiences. As I complete the artwork, the work starts to communicate with me and it starts to give, give me signals that it's finished. And when that happens, the work has taken on its own life. And it's now in a position that when, when exhibited somewhere, it sits there on a the wall, minding its own business. And whoever comes in front of it may be attracted to it, or it may attract them. It may reach out and say, 
And once a person gets close enough, they, they might have a conversation or a dialogue between the two of them, between the artwork and the piece. And if there's something in that person's background or their experience that, that links up with the painting, then the communication is, is really good, and really com complete. I don't know what that communication might be, or if there will be one at all. But if there is one, then the work has done its job because it reached out and touched someone. That's part of the experience where after doing so many things, you get an understanding of what makes for effective composition, what makes for a completeness and so forth. When I was younger, I studied people like Cezanne and Picasso and all the various artists. And when you look at their work, particularly Cezanne, you get a notion as to how they have used the elements in their work to create a sense of composition and to compose is to organize and organizing involves putting things together in interesting effective ways so that you get a combination of things that feel like they're balanced that feel like they're um, supportive of each other they, they create a structure and once the structure has integrity then walk away from it leave it alone The drawings are mostly figurative. There are some drawings that are that use mixed materials as well, or some of the mixed material pieces have drawings in the work. But for the most part, it's it's almost like two separate entities. That's why it's kind of eclectic, <laughs> very eclectic. It's difficult to pin down exactly what I do because it's a combination of representational abstraction. Most things that I do can be recognized by people, but they're done in an abstracted manner with abstracted imagery as well. So the, the reality and the abstraction kind of merge and become one with each other. So it becomes kind of eclectic, because on, on, on some occasions it's, it's pure abstract stuff, and on other occasions it's politically or oriented, and on other occasions it might be uh, oriented towards some disastrous situation that took place with humanity, like the floods or the uh, earthquake or something like that. And I may be responding to some feeling or some attitude about that situation. And if I'm doing collage work or mixed material work, I would be selecting materials that relate to that issue. The earlier drawings were mostly figurative. I guess early on it was a mass of abstracted figurative shapes compressed into a little area and they were oppressed by a line that sat on top. I call them children of society. Eventually that series evolved to a point where that oppressive line was bent into a kind of a parabola shape. And this this mass of humanity welled up into this into this parabola shape. And eventually over a period of time it got reduced to one person. One, one single individual, and pretty soon the parabola shape faded away and became kind of a cloud form. And eventually that faded away when there's left a figure in a landscape setting, much like this. Um, but the figure was rooted to the earth. It was not disappearing off into the cloud someplace. It was tied to the earth, but the heads were always upward, looking upward. There might be something else there. And interestingly enough, the figurative element is still in the work, in the mixed material pieces, like the, in the wall series, when I introduce the shadow into the wall series, the shadow is like a single figure walking past an urban wall, not really engaged with that wall, just passing it without paying much attention to it, just as people pass him or her without paying much attention to them. Born in Georgia, but uh, I didn't know a whole lot about Georgia because I was six years old when we moved away from Georgia. So I just had uh, some memories of my time here. But when we moved to New York from LaGrange, that was a whole different world. 
The buildings were taller, the people, the more people, more noise, more cars, more everything. You know, it was like everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, there was something exciting going on. It was during that time, those early years, growing up in Harlem, that my drawing started to take on more and more emphasis. I was home a lot and I would listen to the radio and I would draw what I was hearing on the radio. Or I would sit and look out the window and draw whatever I could see. Clothes lines from one apartment to another apartment. Or people in the street walking, going places, cars, traffic, noise, and so forth. And by the time I got to junior high school, the art teacher selected four kids and sent us up to uh, the high school of music and art to take the entrance exam. And uh, somewhere between junior high school and getting to the high school, the notion of being an artist started to make more and more sense. When I was about 20 years old, I was in college and uh, said to myself one day, you know, now that I know a little bit about this and a little bit about that, what am I going to do with it? So I, I, I remember sitting in the stairwell once, skipping class, trying to figure out what I was going to do with myself. And I decided that whatever it was I did, um, I had to be able to do what I wanted to do with my work. And it also had to allow me to do something with people, because both things were important to me. So I went into art education and I finished that program and I graduated and became an art teacher. I've been out of teaching now for 17 years. So I've been producing my work and the work has been growing and changing and adjusting and so forth. And I'm still doing that and would like to continue doing that for as long as I can, but I would like to have the work take on more visibility or like more of the world to take on more visibility toward the work. <laughs> Yeah, that would be good. I have some decisions to make about what to do with this work, because it's quite a bit of it. It's, it's accumulated, and um, it needs to go somewhere. <laughs>